again, we're talking about revival and awakening. And again, these terms are oftentimes uh, frowned upon depending on our faith tradition. We've seen them used, we've seen them abused. Uh, we've seen signs scheduling revival next Wednesday at the parking lot under the big tent, right? Or we see them as antiquated terms. And so we need to breathe fresh life into these concepts. We need to breathe fresh understanding and not allow the excesses and the abuses of the past to prevent us from experiencing something powerful, a move of God in our time. And that's my heart. My heart is that we would be so revived, that our communities would be so revived, that we would be the recipients of a great blessing in our time. A third great awakening is my, is my heart cry. So let's talk a little bit about revival and awakening. We've talked about the terms that Mark Shaw has provided us in his book, Global Awakening, a book that I would highly recommend. And now we're going to move forward in terms of applying these. We're going to look at some uh, sy systematic theology in terms of our understanding. And uh, we're going to delve a little deeper into these concepts of eschatology and the apocalypse as they, as they relate to revival and awakening. So when we talk about revival, what are we actually talking about? We're talking about living into, again, days of heaven upon the earth. That's that quote that I keep coming back to from Martin Lloyd-Jones. Uh, we say in InterVarsity that, that, that it's a new season of breakthrough of word, deed, and power that ushers in a new normal. There many different ways to talk about revival and awakening, and people have labored over defining what it is because it is seasonal, right? We, 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 we never see throughout history uh, revival is going on forever. We live in a broken world where we languish under the power of sin, where our enemy, the devil, sits in seats of power and influence and, and controls um, and peoples and people groups, right? But revival are those punctuated seasons that bring in this new normal, this, this, uh, this reign and rule of Jesus. So let's talk a little bit more in depth about this. First of all, my definition, revival is a break in time where the establishment of the kingdom of God becomes the experienced reality of the many instead of the few. It is the case, I believe, that no matter where you're at, no matter where you are in time and space throughout the world, there are people who are experiencing days of heaven upon the earth. They are themselves experiencing radical presence of God, a grace of God in their lives. But it's not revival because the people around them, the community, the tribe that they're a part of, their, their ethnic group, their national uh, community is not experiencing revival uh, at the same time. So a revival is a break in time, right? So that we can say there was a time before revival and now we are in a season of revival. So there's a break in time where the establishment of the kingdom of God becomes the experienced reality of the many instead of the few. Let's delve a little bit deeper into that. But it's, it's fundamental to note that revival is seasonal. Many people who are critics of revival oftentimes talk about, well, if it was really a revival, it would have continued. That misses the entire point. Revivals are seasonal. They have a beginning and they have an end. And revi when revival happens, when the throne room of God breaks through the veil of this world, of this arena, reestablishing the reign and rule of Jesus, the Lamb, which will come in its fullness, we've already talked about this in Revelation chapter 17, when the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. But right now, we're living into that certain eschatological future reign and rule of Jesus in the here and now, days of heaven upon the earth. So I have two theses as I've studied revival and awakening. When it comes to revival, I have two primary theses. Uh, the foundation of all of my reasoning when it comes to revival. First is this, that the entire story of God, the entire meta narrative of scripture, of God's great mission uh, of announcing and bringing the kingdom to the nations culminates in the eschatological realities, like the wedding feast of God and the subsequent city of God, that revivals are these punctuated moments in time where our physical, intellectual, sociological, cultural realities align with the future coming kingdom of Christ. Again, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And that throughout human history, 
The story of God as it begins to unfold in the life of Israel, in the life of these leaders, in the life of this nation, it's all pointing to and leading toward the great apocalypse, where the reign and rule of Jesus, where the reign and rule of heaven becomes normalized in the here and now. And we know at the end of the age that that will be universal, that God will have his way, the kingdom of God will come as it is in heaven, so it will be in the earth. And that revival is actually living into that certain eschatological reality. The second thesis is this, that the epicenter of all divine history is located in the birth, declaration, death, ascension of Jesus, that that's the epicenter, and that the eschatological realities of justice, judgment, and joy are made possible because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross through the power of his resurrection and the reality of his lordship. This is why we preach the gospel. This is why we proclaim the good news because as we proclaim the good news, what we're actually doing is we are actualizing in real space and time, the hope of heaven in people's lives and in our communities. Now listen now, revival then is by necessity rooted in the kingdom that has come in the person of Jesus and the kingdom that will come in his return and reign, Revelation chapter 17, right? That in the, in the parentheses moment that we are in, we are doing mission, and mission is really establishing outposts of heaven in the here and now. A famous uh, missiologist, Stanley Hauerwas, has said that the church is a harbinger of the future, that we are establishing the reign and rule of Christ through our ministry. When we preach the gospel, when we provide that cold drink of water, when we rescue sex slaves, when we uh, stand up for social justice and, and demand uh, that things that should be right, that should be as they are in heaven, must be as they are in the earth. When we are doing those things as the church, the work of evangelization, we are actually stepping into those certain future eschatological realities that will become true universally when Jesus reigns and rules in Europe. Now that's only possible, my friend, because of the gospel. It's only possible because Jesus in his flesh took on our sins, all the things that we've left undone and all the things that we've done. And he took upon himself the punishment to provide the cure for our soul sickness, for our darkness, that he took upon himself the wrath of God so that he could release the grace of God in our lives and in the earth. So these are my two theses when it comes to revival. So then revival is rooted both in the past and in the coming. It's rooted in the actualization of Christ as he will reign and rule for all time in the earth. So that's revival. Those are my two theses. So now let's compare this to this concept of awakening. Oftentimes people conflate these terms, they confuse them, they use them interchangeably. But for the purpose of this video series, I actually see them as two distinct but interrelated concepts. And so revival has more to do with revitalizing the people of God, empowering the people of God to, again, normalize the reign and rule of Christ in their communities and in their world. And then awakening has more to do with society. And so awakening is the initial responsiveness of a people group or a society to the message of the gospel and the kingdom implications of the gospel for their social and cultural structures. Let me unpack that because that's a mouthful. So when awakening comes, it not only comes to individuals, but it begins to spread and impact systemic powers and structures in people groups, right? So awakening is more to do with society. Awakening is more than mass conversion. It's incredibly important, right? We can preach the gospel and see hundreds of thousands of people saved. A good friend of mine actually just did a, a global telecast and uh, millions of people, literally millions of people all around the world prayed to receive Jesus. It's fantastic news. I mean, it's one of the highest expressions of our Christian faith is to preach the gospel and see people come to faith. But that's not what it's all about. I know you, you know, you might be surprised to hear an evangelist say that's not what it's all about because there's more than just mass conversion. God is after the whole thing, not just individuals. He's after peoples, tribes, tongues, languages, and he won't stop until the kingdom of this world becomes the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. So awakening produces, now listen now, the needed energy to reform and renew and reestablish broken and lapsed social structures. 
And these renewed social structure, structures transform people into kingdom vessels. Social transformation is foundational to awakening. In fact, if you study revival and awakening, it doesn't matter if you're talking about the first and great awakening or these awakenings that have happened all throughout the world in non-Western cultures, as Mark Shaw points out, when awakening comes, it creates hospitals and legal systems and uh, uh, foster care systems to care for our widows and orphans. It, it produces social structures. Many of our universities and hospitals in the United States exist because of great and powerful moves of God in the United States. And so when awakening comes, it revitalizes and it creates. There's a spiritual energy that creates new contours in our society and culture. And so I've already alluded to my conviction and my belief in these seven great culture making institutions. And so lots of people talk about this. Uh, I first learned about the seven mountains uh, uh, from Lauren Cunningham of YWAM, uh, Bill Bright of uh, Campus Crusade for Christ, now Crew, uh, taught a lot about Seven Mountains. There are many, many organizations and individuals that are committed to this concept of Seven Mountains. And the basic theory is this, that every people group is comprised, or their society is, is made up out of seven great culture-making institutions. Now, there's some wiggle room in terms of how we define these, uh, some people have a slightly different list. Other people have uh, a different interpretation. Uh, this is mine, and it's not the definitive, but this is how I actually see these culture-making institutions. Any attempt to move the spiritual energy of revival into the social structures of society should always include addressing the following. The unique sin of the structure. So when we're talking about commerce, what is the unique sin of the structure of commerce in our particular context? Well, it, it's probably greed, right? In another cultural context, it might be um, uh, in equitable access to, uh, you know, uh, to, to, to funding, or it might be dishonest scales if we're talking about an agricultural society. But there's always what I call a besetting sin in the institution itself. If we talk about academia, Right? I've spent my entire adult life doing ministry in academia, and I can tell you right now that the besetting sin of academia is pride, right? And so we can talk a little bit about that, but now the second is any dichotomization of those social structures from Christ's kingdom, right? So we shouldn't dichotomize the social structures as if they have nothing to do with the reign and rule of Jesus. So as we move from the spiritual energy of revival into social structures and awakening, we have to address the dichotomization of that institution from the reign and rule of Jesus. Can I tell you that there isn't a single place in the earth where the name of Jesus shouldn't be named. There isn't a single industry, there isn't a single sector of society where the gospel should be unwelcomed or not proclaimed. You know, I lived through the era where there was a lot of boycotting when Christians thought they had power. You know, this was big in the 1980s. Christians would say, we're no longer going to shop at this store. We're no longer going to go to this theme park, thinking that they're, you know, the way in which they spend their money is going to change the world. And uh, because of that, many sectors of our society became demonized. One of those sectors was the entertainment uh, industry particularly film, movies. And so there was a, a large number of Christians that said, we shouldn't watch movies, we shouldn't go to movie theaters, and Christians certainly shouldn't work in the film uh, industry. And that's just ridiculous. And so thank God, brave women and men moved into those industries, those sectors that had been demonized, those places where Jesus hadn't been named, and they moved in with a kingdom power. And really, I think in many ways, brought a kingdom witness that was indigenous and transformative. Third, power structures, gatekeepers, the abilities of these institutions. We, we can't ignore those when we move into, into awakening. We have to address the influencers, the gatekeepers, the people who hold the keys to the kingdom, right? So we're not just after individuals, we're thinking about systems and power structures. You know, one of the great men of our time, you know, there are these people who come about every 100, 200 years, but I think Elon Musk is one of the great innovators of American history, and he's living, he's a contemporary, and he's redefined several industries. Well, 
we should be thinking about not just Tesla, but we should be thinking about impacting people like Elon Musk, who is the Elon Musk of the sports industry, of commerce, of law, of academia. When we move into markets, we need to understand who are the people who are holding the keys to the kingdom and how can we impact them for Christ? And then fourth, the protection of the institution itself so as not to absorb the institution into another structure, particularly the church. So right now in the United States, we have a massive problem called Christian nationalism. And Christian nationalism is an extension of what theologians would call Christendom. And it's this belief that the goal of the Christian faith is to dominate society and culture and to subsume all of its, all of its um, uh, institution, all of its uh, culture making power, right? So that success in gospel ministry is about commandeering political power, commandeering commercial power. That's just not anything that I read in the Bible. That's just not how the gospel moved forward. In fact, if anything, that vision of Christendom killed the Christian church as it was institutionalized in the Roman Empire. And, 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 and God had to fix that in a number of different ways, and it led to all kinds of, uh, you know, maladies in the church. But that is not the goal, friend. The goal is not to subsume these institutions. The church is not to be a substitute for the political realm. It's not supposed to be a substitute for the medical realm. Now, we should have our hand in all of those realms, but the church's job is not to replace these realms but it is to infuse and invade and, and, and to saturate these realms so that these realms become kingdom vessels for the Lord Jesus Christ. So these seven mountains that I keep referring to, here is my list. And again, other people have different lists, but law, commerce, I call leisure, which it would include uh, uh, entertainment, um, you know, the travel industry, anything that has to do with leisure, recreation, medicine, government, family, and academia. These seven mountains are the great culture-making institutions of every people group. And then I have what I call accelerators, right? So these are cultural ampli amplifiers or transponders. There are other things that actually accelerate the movement of these institutions in our lives. You know, things like the arts. So the arts are not themselves an institution but the arts accelerate these institutions. We think about the role of arts uh, in, in academia. We think about the role of arts in commerce. Uh, the arts are an incredible culture-making uh, transponder and uh, uh, accelerate, right? And so the arts are incredibly important. In fact, I believe that uh, the arts are, are, are one of the most powerful ways in which the gospel moves forward into the hearts of people. And we shouldn't see arts and artists as tools to be used, but rather expressions of the transcendent and the divine. That's for a whole another lecture. Another example would be technology. And these are just examples. This isn't a, an exhaustive list, but technology accelerates and transponds culture. And we certainly see that in the rise of uh, digital media, social media, that uh, technology has the ability to accelerate. And then traditions, right? I'm a, a proud member of the University of Michigan alumni, and we have traditions that go back uh, a couple hundred years, and those traditions accelerate culture. They transpond culture through the institution of academia, and certainly news, uh, and there's no um, shortage of places to get news and misinformation these days, and then what I would call religion. And this isn't necessarily the kingdom work of the church, but the institutionalized expressions of religion also have the ability to capture, maintain, accelerate, and transpond culture. And so those are some examples. The global church is itself, and it, uh, it, it is itself the way in which these institutions come into being, as well as how they're sustained and how they are revitalized. But let's make no mistake, the church is not to be any one of these. It is not to commandeer these things. So when we talk about awakening, what we're really talking about is awakening happens when through the social agency of these seven culture-making institutions, the reign of Christ is actualized. 
And the kingdom transforms those structures and the people in those systems and structures into kingdom vessels. In short, listen now, it is a reflection of the world to come when the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. And so just like I had two theses when, when it came to revival, my two theses around awakening are these. First of all, God's intent is to draw all human history to a close around his great dream of the kingdom of God for all peoples, individuals, people groups, tribes, nations. And we see his intent to redeem not merely people, but systems and structures that constitute groups of all sizes. Awakening is more than mass conversion. It's more importantly, it is the conversion of the institutions and structures and cultural manifestations of peoples and people groups so that they become cultural vehicles of the kingdom of God. You see, it's a much bigger vision than just individuals praying to receive an individual salvation so that they can individually go to heaven. God isn't going to stop until it's all his. And he's playing a long game of chess. And he's not going to stop until there is a checkmate, until it all becomes his, until the kingdom of this world becomes the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. My second thesis is this, that in the person of Christ, in his declaration of the kingdom and the securing of the kingdom through his death and resurrection, we have the present power to be personally transformed. But also social awakening and institutional revitalization are also possible because we have the kingdom power of God. Can I tell you that the, for, so, for far too long, the church has thought too little of its ability to transform the world. We make disciples, we see people pray, we plant a church, it's all well and good. But can I tell you, God has given us the resurrection power of God that can change the entire world. Awakening is the demonstrative reign of Christ, both resurrecting and birthing new expressions of culture and institutional life in people groups. So, in summation, awakening is rooted in the historic power and victory of the cross and resurrection and the certainty of the coming eschatological kingdom. And that is where mission comes in. That revival and awakening are possible because of what Christ has done. The mission, the evangelization mission of the church happens between these two windows of the kingdom that has come and the kingdom that is yet to come. And that revival is a season, a punctuated season that is gifted from heaven to earth as we pursue the King of Kings and declare his power and reign in the earth. And so that's revival and awakening. In the, uh, the next uh, video, we'll talk about some, some sometimes, some always, some truths that uh, we can see throughout time uh, when it comes to revival. And we'll talk about what does revival actually look like when, uh, when we are um, experiencing it through our own tribal uh, lens.